In this video, we're going to take a look at the solutions to the contract exercises. So in the, at the end of the previous video, we asked you to implement token contracts that passed all these contract tests. So if you haven't done that yet, just jump back to the previous video and give it a go. Um, so here we are with our contract tests. So we've got a series of about eight or so tests. So we're just going to work through each one in turn and write token contract to make, um, to make these tests pass. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that token contract implements contract. So here we're checking that the token contract is an instance of contract. So if you remember in Corda, every contract must be an instance of a class that extends the contract interface. And so let's just do that now. There we go. And because we've implemented contract, we're going to have to implement the verify method as well where we do our checking. And there we go. So, ah, sorry, that should be implements contract. There we go. So that first test should now pass. So our token contract is now a contract. Yep, so that passed. And the next test is that the token contract requires zero inputs in the transaction. So remember, we took a look at this contract DSL in the previous video, but basically, we're creating a dummy transaction here and giving it an input and asserting that the transaction should fail to verify. And here we're creating a transaction with no input and we're asserting the transaction should verify. So there's a bit of roundabout logic here because by the transaction failing to verify, our test passes, whereas if the transaction verifies successfully here, then our test will fail. We want our contract to reject any transaction with an input except one without an input. So we can write that as follows, and there's going to be a lot of different ways to write these contract rules, but what we can just say is if transaction.get inputs states.size not equal to zero, throw new legal argument. Here we can put whatever message we like, but something along the lines of um, transaction must have zero inputs. There we go. And we can run this test now. Ah, some exception here. Ah, so I haven't updated my compiler settings as we talked about previously. So here, let me just re add those and just do a complete rebuild. And now if we go back and run the test again. This test now passes. So if you remember, we had to update our compiler settings to make sure that um, the JVM used uh, named parameters and that allows Corda's serialization framework to work. And so if we move on to the next test, we can see that the next test is that the transaction the contract requires one output in the transaction. So here we're adding two outputs and checking that the transaction fails to verify. And here we're adding one and checking that if it can successfully verifies. So again, this is going to be straightforward. So just going back to here, if transaction.get output states dot size not equal to one, throw new illegal argument exception, transaction must have one input. And we can run that test now. And so this is basically what contract writing is. It's just writing a series of failure conditions for the transaction. And so now we've prevented a, a token issuance transaction that has not exactly zero inputs and one output. Then here we're saying that the token contract requires one command in the transaction. So here we're adding two commands. The transaction fails to verify. We add one command, it verifies. And so these, all these checks here are the checks we were referring to earlier as kind of the checks on the shape of the transaction. We want there to be certain number of inputs, outputs, and um, commands. Transaction must have one command. So each time we're checking a condition, if it's not true, then we're throwing a legal argument exception. So let's run this as well. 
There we go. So now we're going to move on to checks more on the contents of the transaction. So I'll go a bit faster now. So we want the transaction to have an output state that is a token. And we also want, in this longer test here, we want the output token to have a positive amount. And we want the command to be an issue command. So let's go through all three of those. Those are our content requirements. So we want to grab that output, check it's a token state, check it has a positive value, grab that command and check it, say an issue command. So what we can do is if we can get the output here, so we can say um, get output states get zero. And we can get the command as well. So command, command. There we go. Oh, I think we might be able to do that. Can we do that? Or get output zero. Does that work? So there you go. There's various things you can do to access the contents of the transaction. And then we want to do some checks here. So we say if output. Um, and so here we have to say if not output instance of uh, token state, throw a new illegal argument exception, output must be a token state. And if not command instance of issue, Uh, and so remember a command pairs a list of signers with a type. So here we're going to check that the type is of type issue. And then later on we can also access the signers and post some rules there. So command must be issue, issue command. There we go. And finally we just need to check that the output, if, so the output has a positive amount, so if we can actually, let's cast it to a token state now. And here we can say if token dot amount less than um, zero, throw, throw new legal argument exception, um, token amount must be positive. There we go. So that should pass our next barrage of tests. So let's just run all of them now and see what happens. And so if you remember, we've imposed rules on the contents of the transaction, the shape of the transaction. And our final test here is just to check that the issuer is a required signer. So we don't check the actual signatures here, but we do have to check the required signers. And otherwise, if we didn't have this rule here, anyone could issue themselves tokens. So it's very important for any issue token to be able to say, well, it's the, the issuer must sign. Otherwise, anyone could issue themselves tokens issued by someone else. And so here we want to get the required signers first. So here we can say list public key required signers. equals command dot get signers. So remember the signs are listed on the command. And here we're going to if and here we're going to say issuer, so party issuer equals token dot get issuer. And here we're going to say if required contains issuer dot owning key. So we can actually break this out. So we can say public key issuers key equals issuer dot get owning key. And here we say if not required signers contains issuers key. Throw a new legal argument exception. Um, issuer is required or issuer must be required signer. So let's run that final test now.
There we go. And so you can see here we've kind of fully built out our token contract. So it implements the contract interface as a verify method that takes a transaction. And the goal in verify is to look at that transaction and throw an exception if there's anything about it you don't like. So here we're going to throw an exception if there's not exactly zero inputs, throw an exception if there's not exactly one output, throw an exception if there's not exactly one command, throw an exception if the output isn't a token state or the command is an issue, um, throw an exception if the token's amount is less than zero, and throw an exception if the issuer isn't one of the required signers. And in this way we can control the evolution of token states over time. In summary, we've seen how the quarter ledger is updated over time by proposing transactions that consume some existing set of states to issue some new set of states. Transactions also contain commands which indicate the intent but also the required signers of a transaction. And whether a transaction is valid or not is decided by the transaction's contracts. And contracts are instances of classes implementing the contract interface and each contract must have a verify method that imposes a set of constraints on the transaction proposals. And for each transaction proposal, if it doesn't meet the constraints or the requirements set out in the transaction's contracts, then the transaction is considered invalid and can't become a valid ledger update. That's the end of this section. In the next section, we'll be looking at quarter flows.